as I've far back as we can remember. I, I feel more like horror chose us than the other way around. Our parents, especially my mom, loved horror movies. She had this massive Stephen King collection, oh, yeah. and she would just let us watch what she watched. She watched horror movies. <laughs> We weren't allowed to watch anything until we were 10, so that was the one that broke the seal. It was Poltergeist, which is horrible for children because it's designed to terrify yeah. children. And we made it through the movie because we're like, if we make it through this, we can watch all of them. And then bedtime happened, and we started to freak out as children do that have been traumatized. Yeah. And my mom did something that completely backfired. She explained what we had actually seen. She explained directors, actors, sets monster makers and said it was their job to scare people. I was like, whoa, 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 it can be your job to scare people? And then we became gore heads. We're like, well, mom, I want to see Hellraiser. It's just art. <laughs> and we watch movies with it, like gore and blood and guts and be like, they didn't blend the lines very good there. Do you see the lines? Mom, the blood's so colored good. funny. Sylvia Jen, shut up. <laughs> she also uh, tricked us into being really good readers because she said, you can't re see any Stephen King movie until you read the book. So we'd sit there with our massive novel and our thesauruses looking up the F word and be like, I don't know what it means. It's if just there's a any, sentence enhancer. If there's anything in the book you don't understand, girls, ask me afterwards. So, Mom, what does that mean? <laughs> oh, that's nothing. Don't, you don't need to know what that is. She, he just Stephen, called him a jerk. Stephen really? King is good at making up like new swear words, too. So there's a lot of expletive pirate and something wrangler. Yeah. So what was your approach to making this film? Like, how did you kind of package it? Well, we're huge fans of the, cl well, we're 80s brats. We loved Halloween, we loved Hellraiser, we loved Friday the 13th. And a lot of slasher movies nowadays and horror movies don't really have that feel to it. So it's we so formulaic. It, it feels it like is. you've seen the movie before. Especially in North American horror, yeah. it just follows this formula where it literally at the beginning you can be like, okay, that's the highest paid actor, so obviously they live to the end and didn't catch his name, so he's gonna die. We wanted uh, this film to be a throwback to those 80s films that you would watch and you'd get excited with like, theme music and like costume design and masks and weapons and, and all even that. classic slashers before they sub genre mm -hmm. everything and was like well a slasher has to be A, B, and C. It's yeah. like no, a slasher can still be creative. So we took a lot of the conventional rules and totally threw them out and as we like to think of ourselves as the fangirl directors, we make movies with stuff that we would be excited to see. And we're like, oh, if I'm excited to see this, hopefully other people would. Yeah, and uh, it's our first scary movie, so we're like, oh my god, let's scare the shit out of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's also got a whole range of emotions. You'll laugh, you'll cry if you're cool. Yeah, if you don't cry, cry or you're cool. If you don't cry, you're a little too tough for my blood. Yeah, yeah. This has like, got at least three good crying moments, like my mom is going to be upset at th oh, three things, yeah. definitely. I'm really upset, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll answer for that later. And then I'll be like, Mom, it's your fault. <laughs> Was it important to you that this uh, stands alone as, as a sequel, or do you want it to be really, really attached to the first film? Mm, we wanted to build on what was already in the first film. I feel that Jacob Goodnight should have always been a character up with Michael Myers and Jason and Freddy and Pinhead. I feel the first film fell a little short of accomplishing that and I feel this film definitely puts him on par with those other horror icons. I can't tell you all the reasons why but there's a lot of reasons why. Yeah, you, we could have took what Jacob Goodnight was and what we always felt he should be, especially because yeah. we, we started watching wrestling when Kane got introduced. So when we found out we were going to direct a movie with Kane, we freaked out. And then we're like, we have to make this exactly this because we had all these crazy ideas like, oh, well, we can really push the boundaries. We can make this really scary. We can really develop this character in a weird, different way. And it was so important for us to have a difference between Glenn Jacobs, Kane, and Jacob Goodnight because everyone knows Glenn Jacobs and everyone knows Kane, and Jacob Goodnight had to be his completely own individual guy. Yeah. How hard was that to do it to separate Kane and Jacob Goodnight? It's difficult because Kane has been being Kane for like yeah. 17 years. Everybody knows him. It's so funny because sometimes people are like, oh, how's Kane? And I say Glenn and they're like, who? And I'm like, oh, that's right. Some people don't know. The artist Kane formerly is, known as. Is Glenn. <laughs> and, and, and so it became this thing that we obsessed over, but from look. 
from uh, different scenes, from even theme music. He is totally Jacob Goodnight in a way no one's seen him before. Yeah. We were really happy with the result, but we went, we went fucking nuts over it. <laughs> there are some WWE uh, fan moments oh, in yeah. there. I can't say what, but if you're a WWE fan, and everybody in the universe should be, there's moments that you'll be like, oh, the twins did this because they love that. Oh, I can't believe they, oh, oh. did they seriously? Yeah. Lol. Were there any favorite moments while directing? When um, we had our very good friend Catherine Isabel, who we worked together on American Mary, come back to be a uh, play at a girl called Tamara in this movie, Katie and us, when the three of us got together, it's just some kind of weird, crazy kind of magic. We always say she's like our Johnny Depp. Which she is. She is. And by the way, she's threatened to kill me if I don't put her in any movies that I make. So if I disappear, it's you Catherine know. Catherine Isabel. And the stuff she pulled off in this, and it's a character she's never really gotten to play before because a person as stunningly attractive as her, it's like, oh, well, she can only be this. It's like, well, what if she's a character? What if she's somebody that you really recognize in the movie? And uh, there are a few moments we just took the piss out of each other because we torture them. It, it's like a Sam Raimi, Bruce Campbell relationship we have with her. She's like, oh, what am I gonna do? I'm like. Oh yeah, nothing. It's easy. Just go down here, and then you're like, okay, so get the blood cannon ready. <laughs> Let's really throw her through that. And you're like, oh no. And then she comes back. You hear, stop, stop, stop. You bitches. <laughs> I think my favorite scene in the movie is a scene we created that is the expositional dialogue scene. And sometimes you need to, especially when you're doing a sequel, you need to get a certain amount of information out. And I hate it when it's just so deliberate and you can say, oh, this is for people that didn't see the first one. Turned out to be the best scene in the whole movie because you don't even notice that she's catching you up on what happened in the last one. And she I has a scene with her and Lee Majdu, who plays Carter, her boyfriend, and Glenn. And uh, <laughs> I don't even, when, when you see the scene, there's no doubt that that's the, oh my god, the twins did not just do that scene. It's the scene that she's done some interviews for. She's like, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to live this down. And I'm like, hee hee, yes, the you are. Sets, the gift sets are going to be the bane of her existence. But she's phenomenal. <laughs> if you ever go off script and say, well, you know, this would really work much better if we did this. Yeah. Oh, I we did, especially Danielle, because she's a filmmaker as well, and she's so brilliant. Before yeah. we did anything, I would take Danielle aside and be like, okay, so let's talk about the scenes today. What are you feeling? What are you not feeling? And we'd work through it. There's also a couple scenes that we, uh, we gave Glenn. Yeah, they were modified just because it becomes an organic living thing, and you mm -hmm. don't want to just be forced to do one thing when you feel something else might be working. And having Danielle's uh, expertise on I mean, oh, yeah. Since she was like this big, she's been hanging out with big, giant serial killers. So she had stuff. She was like, well, why don't I do this? And why don't I do this? I was like, no, if you're going to be trapped, you're really going to be trapped. And yeah. she was so good at it. Oh, she, yeah, she'd be like, I could get through there. Yeah, but if someone was behind me, I'd get out there in a second. I'm like, oh, okay, we're going to have to recreate that. Honest okay. to God, if Jacob Goodnight d was real and he showed up, I would phone Daniel Harris because I wouldn't die. Oh. That girl is an Amazon. Yeah. She is so powerful. If they get locked in that room, Daniel will kill them all and eat them and be fine. She is amazing. She's gotten stuck in elevators and hit the thing out and climbed out. I'm like, what? Are you a Xena warrior? <laughs> what kind of human does that? She is Xena warrior She's princess. She is Xena warrior she princess. She absolutely is. <laughs> One of my favorite things about, make, uh, about American Mary was the humor. And oh, you guys thank you. said that this, was, this, this one has some pretty good jokes. Uh, this one's it's a, we have a dark sense of humor, and this one's funnier than American Mary. And it's Katie that we she got a lot of good jokes. And you know, th this is a this movie at times is very self-aware, which is part of the fun of it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the thing that makes Twenty One and Twenty Two Jump Street like such a funny movie because. You know, you, you do a play on like the slutty girl in this, or a play on like the colored guy, or a play on the so-and-so, or the, the, the heroine. It was just so nice to have the hot girl also be the funniest person yeah. in the entire movie. Like my crew, we had to reshoot things because they were laughing so hard at what Katie was doing, and I'd be like, you idiots, stop it, don't <laughs> stop it.
You've talked about some of your like previous influences and in growing up and how your mother affected you. What are your, some of your more recent influences? Oh, wow. Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon is one of my yeah. biggest influences. And it's funny saying that, you know, he's a comic book director and writer, but I started watching Roseanne back when he was a story editor. And to see, I was not a very big girl, I was not a very strong girl, but Buffy came out the same time and I was her age, and she made me feel strong and powerful. And Joss Whedon loves to make characters that are unconventional and cosplayable. So that's always our goal in films too. And I, I always try to fight to do that, especially when I go into wardrobe, I'm like, no, no, he can't wear this. He's got to wear something that people are going to want to wear. And no one's going to want to wear that. No, if we do it right, people are going to want to dress like that. They said that with American Mary. Oh, nobody is going to dress like her. How many girls have walked around in lingerie and little plastic aprons since then? Some awesome ones. Some dudes, too. They pull that right <laughs> off. I haven't seen a drag queen do it yet. So. I did. <gasps> you thought yeah. it was a girl. <gasps> yeah. I'll show you later. You thought it was a girl. She I can legs. die happy now. Someone can come in and assassinate me. Let's hope not. I have a few more movies still. <laughs> no, right before something's released, I can... That would be great for press. Oh, yeah. She always wanted a $100 million opening weekend, guys. So if we could all just go see the movie over and over and over again, <laughs> just leave buckets of money there. It would, for her She memory. always wanted to break the previous box office. <laughs> <laughs> um, the coolest thing about uh, the new films that we have done is uh, Jennifer and I were always really fascinated with stunts. And we, we had a few in Dead Hooker in a Trunk, and we had a few in American Mary. But see no evil, we got to really up the stunts because you can't just, mm, you're dead. They gotta struggle and they gotta suffer. Especially when you have a big bad ass like cave oh. slash Glenn Jacobs slash Jacob Goodnight. If the drinking game is every time he breaks something, you take a shot. And if, if they say Jacob, you take a shot, a drink. Good, good night, you take a drink. And if they say, Jacob, good night, you finish your you drink. You finish your drink. They'll yeah. be drunk in the first ten minutes. Uh, That's a terrible I think idea. you can survive. I think you can make it through. <laughs> but take a sip when he breaks things, because he breaks everything. And he's really strong. Like, he's a very sweet, lovely gentleman, but he's insane. If he snapped, strong. we'd all be dead. Like, I remember I was standing with my uh, stunt coordinator, Kamani Smith, and we had three guys bring this steel uh, tape, slab, yeah. slab in and this put it down table. there. And in the scene, Glenn flips it over. And then we're with like, one hand, with one way. hand, and then we're like, <laughs> reset. And then the guys come in, and Glenn's like, this? He just picks it up, puts it down. With and one arm, he just leans over and pulls it up. And, my and Kamani leans over to me, he's like, he could kill us all. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he could. I don't think he will. And I was like, if that happens, I'm going to go behind you. <laughs> There's a point in the movie where he has a weapon, and he slices with it, and Kamani was like, nobody go near him, because if, it, and it wasn't a, re it was a dull thing, it's like, he will, he will chop your, your head, your head right it'll come clean off, off. It, no sound effect needed, it makes a whoosh noise when he does it, just in nature. Well, you guys will eventually see it, but that was one of the fun things that we decided, got to do new weapons entirely for him, so you see things that you haven't seen before, because... What's a slasher really? movie without some really epically awesome kills? And everything you loved in the first movie, which you should totally get as well, will also be in the second movie. Yeah. Because we're fans. Except for the dog. No, we killed the dog. The dog that pees on him at the end, we killed it. Nobody pees on her, Glenn. Mm -mm. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Okay. <laughs> what a note to go out on. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Oh, thank Such you. a pleasure. Thank you, guys.